The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And I hope everyone had a very Merry Christmas. And we are back in spiritual business here at the Stoa. And today is the last session of Jordan Hall's Reverse Sensemaker in Residence series. This is a series designed uh, to put Jordan at the edge of his own thinking um, and open himself to the wisdom of the, the Stoa village. And the through line of the series so far was the commons and commoning. Um, so how today's gonna work, uh, I will tag in Jordan in a moment and he will share his opening thoughts. After that, um, after Jordan shares his thoughts, that will uh, serve as an invitation for his Dialogos buddies for today, who I'll introduce in a moment uh, to be invited into the conversation. Uh, so when they feel called to speak, they'll just use their discernment to unmute themselves uh, and share their thoughts. That will go on about uh, 60 to 70 minutes. I'll jump in and then we'll engage in a Q&A for the remainder of the time. And we're here for 90 minutes in total. So we might have, um, 20 to 50 minutes for Q&A. So that being said, uh, anyone who's not a guest today, uh, turn off your camera uh, because it'll make the recording better um, uh, and for the, for the YouTube. Uh, and I'll introduce, while everyone does that, I'll introduce our star-studded Dialogos lineup for today. Um, I just wanna see if everyone is here. I think everyone except Nora is here. Um, okay, so... Uh, Nora was going to be here, Nora Bateson, but I don't think she's here, so I'll, I'll hold off that introduction. Uh, we got Greg Thomas, uh, a past guest at the STOA, CEO of Jazz Leadership Project, and is doing an awesome course called Cultural Intelligence, Transcending Race, Embracing Cosmos. Uh, and Greg's going to do this epic series at the STOA in February. Um, and I'll get back to you on the, that, Greg, uh, soon. <laughs> that was an outstanding email for me. Uh, and we got Richard Bartlett. Uh, another past guest. Uh, Rich is the founder, co-founder of Inspiral, Lumio, uh, and the Hum. And the hum. Um, he's uh, super informed on a lot of the, what John would call, John Vake would call uh, participatory knowledge on how groups form in common. Uh, and then we got Chris Master Pietro, uh, um, the bard himself, John Vake's Dialogos, partner in crime, co-author of Zombies uh, in the Western Culture, a 21st Century Crisis um, with John. He's also one of my favorite uh, Zoom drinking buddies since uh, COVID came online. So thank you for that, Chris. Um, so that being said, I'm just going to hide a few people's uh, uh, cameras. All right, can you guys hear me? All right. So the, um, the, the story began with an inquiry into the, the question of governance, and in particular, the question of how governance, if we can go deeper into the essence of the question of governance and, and use that depth to come back out into a, a new place that is more appropriate to, um, well, first of all, where, where we're headed. Um, and in the context of the question of governance, uh, a proposition that the notion of the commons and more specifically the notion of the, of the verb to common or commoning is not only a, an, an irreducible aspect of any notion or of governance, but is in fact possibly more fundamental. It is the most, the most fundamental, sort of the, the root stock or the junction point to the point to the uh, the tree of relevance that from which we can then emerge the next thing. But that to the degree to which we need to find ourselves reinventio, sort of breaking away from the architectures of propositional um, frame that we've lost ourselves in, um, the the thing to which the axis Monday to which we can return is that which is truly owned, that which is, um, ends up being very similar to, if not exactly the same as the sacred and the relationship of what it means to sacred the world into being. Um, and I noticed that uh, two things over the past week. One was that uh, at least in a explicit sense, my experience of the hyper conversation um, went away. So in the previous two weeks, there's a very like a burst, a frenzy of activity going on in lots of different channels. Uh, and last week, I'm not sure that I engaged in any conversations outside of the, the physical with my family, um, Christmas being a sort of a notable raison d'etre. Um, then, of course, in the in the more subtle level, perhaps that's the whole point. And there's a, a deeper lesson to be found there. 
Um, and then I also noticed as I was uh, preparing myself for this morning, the question of how kept coming up, right? The sound of a, uh, uh, one of those bells you see at a, at a Buddhist monastery sort of ringing and vibrating slowly and wanting to come up from the gut. Um, so I'll put that into the space. I'm right now quite open to see and intrigued to find out what happens with this, this uh, fourth episode and how all the different threads are rewoven back together as we common together, as we yarn, I suppose, without Tyson here. I'll start by jumping in, Jordan, if I may. Um, I have to admit, I did not see the most recent, the one that was just posted yesterday. So apologies if there's any retreading that could have been avoided by that. But um, I was very struck by the first two and struck by the discussion in the second, particularly the, the running metaphor that was used, the running metaphor of atmosphere that was used to describe the, the valence of the commons and how the commons is both possessible in a sense of being internalized, but not possessable and the sense of being fundamentally having a locus from without as it pertains to each individual and the identity of each individual, that it's inclusive of the person, but ultimately beyond the person. And the conversation veered into talking about rights and responsibilities. And I thought that was kind of interesting because in many ways, rights and responsibilities insofar as governance are concerned are kind of two aspects of what we might call virtue. And I would be very interested in understanding virtue as a way of understanding the commons. I'm thinking back, of course, to the Socratic tradition and the tradition in particular of disabusing individuals from the notion that virtue is something that is an egoic possession, something that is fundamentally owned and pervade by an individual who possesses it as a matter of their particular idiolect, their particular form of life as bounding virtue into a particular aspect in a particular presentation. So right, one of the things that Socrates does famously is he forces people into the apparatic realization that their particular model of virtue, the virtue that they possess in the particular context and implicature of their lives is actually inidentical to the source of that virtue. And so one thing he does is he, by, by abruptly dispossessing people of their claims to virtue, their claims to the ownership of virtue. He resituates virtue as something that exists ever beyond the reach of each individual, but something that is subject to the participation of individuals when their attention is directed properly, like the needle on a compass. Um, so I would just be interested in, in introducing virtue into the notion of commons, because in the last session, there were all kinds of interesting ideas as to what really do we mean? What, what are instances of commons? And it seems to me that one of the most ancient and prototypical ways of understanding the difference between the commons and the, the idiosyncratic form of life of the individual is to understand the parent of virtue as that which is not possessed and the way that individual actions are affiliated by the parent of virtue when they come into right relation to it. So I'm going to throw that into the mix and, uh, and see where it lands. Just a thought. I think I'll give it a go. Can you all hear me fine? Cool. Well, to take off from you, Christopher, um, the relationship between virtue and the commons, uh, between virtue and, and governance. Um, for me, many of these 
discussions um, comes back to culture. I mean, as Peter mentioned, culture is kind of my thing. And so I see and look through the lens and feel through the lens of culture, culturally, as a culturalist. So from that perspective, when we're talking about culture, we're talking about you know, a combination or synthesis of meaning and values and tools and artifacts in a very you know, basic way, of course, symbols and such. Uh, virtue or virtues seems to me, and I'm leaning a bit on the work of a colleague of mine, friend and colleague, Stephen McIntosh, head of the Institute for Cultural Evolution, where I'm a fellow. Um, he talks about virtue quite a bit in his work. In fact, uh, his last book on developmental politics, he talks about um, the energy in the neosphere, you know, virtue energy, and that is turned into conversations on wisdom energy um, that he's engaged in through his work. And he actually engaged in an actual conversation with Greg Enriquez about that, because Greg more recently has come to some similar uh, feeling tones, I just don't want to say concepts, feeling tones. So virtue um, seems to me, we can look at some of the primary virtues that comes out of the Western intellectual and philosophical tradition. So um, the good, the true, the beautiful as fundamental descriptions of that which we mean by virtue. Um, so if the good, the true, and the beautiful are common, you know, you know I'm trying to uh, select my words carefully. I was going to say common possessions. Um, I don't think I necessarily want to say possessions, I guess common, common values that human beings share across culture. This is, a, I think, a cross-cultural dynamic, though. Each culture or cultural formation or cultural matrix may express the good, true, and beautiful differently. And you could look at that, you know, uh, through ontology, you could look through the through phylogeny, you can look at it through time or you can look through, through an individual in terms of a developmental vertical trajectory, how the differences as to what's good, true and beautiful manifests, you know, you can use spiral dynamics, you can use, you know, um, integral meta theory, even meta modern, you can use all of those to look at how those formulate at the different um, developmental levels. Um, it seems to me that that could be a place that we start with the good, true, and beautiful. Um, another thing I like to add, because uh, for me, I think this is also cross-cultural or even universal among cultures, is music. Um, music often comes up as a, a framework, a metaphor, an analogy often in these very high-level discussions that I have witnessed in the last, uh, not only this year, this pivotal year of 2020, but uh, even previous to it. And I'm deeply immersed and ensconced in music. That's also where I come from. Uh, and I think music is another aspect that we can actually go into more detail on uh, or through to discuss some of the issues of the commons. Um, in preparing for this, I did listen to all of the and I did listen at, you know, in the AM this morning to uh, last week's session. Um, and one way or the other music comes in and I like to presence that and actually go into some more detail, but I'll end by asking a question. I mean, when we look at certain movements today in the postmodern space and we look in social justice um, space, you know, one of the questions that if I had a chance to speak to Ibram X. Kendi let alone Robin DiAngelo, would be, uh, what's the music of your movement? What, what is the good, true, and beautiful of what you're trying to attain, attain to? And of course, they have answers to that, because there is um, a postmodern value system that 
It's very, very important. But the question for the level of the game B comments that uh, Jordan is, is riffing on, it's got to go beyond that. It's got to be post postmodern. It's, it's, that's too limited a frame. So then it comes down to what, is, what, does a, what does the good, true, and beautiful look like in game B? What does it look like uh, in a metamodern space? What does it look like in an integral space, for example? And I so hope and pray that Nora comes here because I love her work um, and, 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 and wanted to actually riff on some of her works. And I'm, I'm just praying that she comes. If she doesn't, I'll bring her in, uh, <laughs> you know, but um, I, I'll leave it there. And, and I want to say also thank you. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. And thank you, Jordan, for having these sessions. We've had some interaction. <laughs> and so it's really great to engage with you and, and also with Evan and, and Christopher, whose work I'm also familiar with. And there is Richard Bartlett, who I'm not as familiar with, but I'm looking forward to uh, engaging with you too. Hey, Greg. Good to hey, meet you. Man. Good to meet you too. Um, I'm also grateful to be invited. Um, when when Peter calls, you know, I listen. Um, I saw the first, the, the intro opening video, and if I recall correctly, the invitation there was to make a kind of orchestra from our different instruments. And I only assume that Peter invited me to, because he knows a bit about my instrument, which is a very... Um, you know, I'm an engineer, not a philosopher. I'm, I'm pretty on the ground. And um, I can do this game where we uh, access a bunch of abstractions and, and draw the connections between them. And this is a parent of that. And I can kind of do that when I, when I really put my mind to it. Um, but I need it to be anchored uh, literally on the ground for me to get kind of to really bring all my senses on, online, I guess, and to, to participate fully. So I guess my opening question is maybe for each of us, or maybe it's just for Jordan, I don't know, I can just throw it into the middle. Um, it's like, what's at stake here? Like, why, why have a conversation, a hyper conversation extended over weeks about commenting? Um, like, are you, what are you, what are you doing that what needs do you have? Why do you need a better understanding of commenting? Are you, are you um, currently engaged in some kind of grounded practice that is where you're feeling the limitations of, ah, I'm not really fully equipped. Um, and then if I can get that sort of picture, then I'm, I feel ready to get out the equipment, you know, but until I've got that, it's a bit like, I'll be sitting back and uh, maybe occasionally asking questions, but I, I don't know if I'll, I'll play the abstraction game um, it doesn't seem like it's my instrument to play. That's a great question, but I'm going to definitely let Jordan, you know, since, uh, in, in, you know, his name is on the marquee of this series. So definitely Jordan, you may, <laughs> why don't you go? I got some answers to that too, but uh, yeah. Am I off mute now? I've lost track of the UI. Sorry. I've been listening very deeply. <sighs> I feel like I actually kind of want to do a little bit of um, rolling with and then come and land. So um, I actually, it's funny, as Christopher was speaking, I felt Greg. Uh, in fact, I, could, I began to realize that I couldn't even understand what Christopher was talking about unless and until I almost like felt Greg embracing it. And there was something about the relationship between Socrates and jazz, something about the, the tonal movement of the discovery of the ability to weave together into an emergent field and feel the field flow through us, which is the actual creation and playing of virtue. And then as I felt that, I was like, okay, dude, we've got to find a way to language that in a new form so that we can kind of get away from these fucking Greek terms that are really sweet when Chris and, and uh, Johnny B drop them back in, but they're not going to land well, right? we got to kind of get, they got to be more cool. we got to get more cool terms that kind of speak themselves into existence with more authenticity from the mouths of the now. Um, and then what happened is I had this weird remembrance of like this, this feeling of like inversion or movement. And it dawned on me that it was actually like a three-step. And the three-step was something like, 
there was a point at which we were held together in a wholeness where the conversation or the question of how do we how do we sort of play together was unconscious right it's just where we came from it's who we were it's how we did our thing and then there was a schism a break with that and, and every step of that break there was this weird shift that pulled virtue out of the embodied person living life and tried to fit into a shared structure that we all participated with and then you know richard actually named the, the orchestra right the notion of no, 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 we don't learn how to play together. What we do is we reify it into the sheet music. Right? And the sheet music, if we all learn how to read that code and play that code, we have this sort of maestro up in front kind of waving his hands together, we can play together. We get a whole bunch of folks to play music together. And it's this grand symphonic majesty, right? And there's, there's that vibe, right? And that movement. And what happens, of course, is that the individual becomes an instrumentality of the formal structure. And the beauty of the formal structure is real. There's something real there for sure. And it creates a possibility. Um, but then as I, I, my own personal experience, actually, I was actually flashed back to sitting in, uh, I guess, my second year of law school. Um, and having a, there was a conversation going on. And the conversation had to do exactly precisely with the moments of lack of virtue at the juridical level. And the movement, the unconscious bias towards stripping away responsibility and authority from the individuals and trying to put that into the structure, into the, into the way the legal structure tries to do its thing. And more, after that, I thought about this in the, in the context of being in, uh, as an entrepreneur and this thing called Six Sigma and GE, right? the, the notion of can we create formal structures where individuals are essentially irrelevant cogs that very neatly fit into a machine and we focus on making sure the machinery works really really well and the individuals can play their role but then i can kind of throw you know i can drop and drag and drop people into those roles which is the natural evolution of that way of thinking and then now the emergence the breaking through of a higher tone right from that first to the second to the third and the third tone is now a, a discovery of the impossibility of that second tone of dealing with the stuff we need to actually deal with so now richard we're getting to the notion of the stakes what's up what's up is all that stuff we've actually used to solve problems collectively uh, is not only no longer working, it couldn't possibly work, and it's part of the problem. But we can't go back, so we got to go forward. But we don't know how to go forward. Well, how do we go forward? We have to start, start listening more deeply. And as I'm sort of, I've been watching this thing for a long time, like really sitting back and looking at it and seeing the kind of the, the pieces flying off the, the, the jet and you know, flames shooting out of the engines going, this motherfucker is going to crash. Everybody inside is like, you know, just turning the volume up on their headphones and getting closer to the screen. Oh, shit, this is bad news, guys. And they're looking at it going, none of the choices, none of the approaches that people keep coming up with, all these smart and well-intentioned folks and trying to do things, they're not going to work. Like you run them out. They fail for a variety of very specific reasons. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And then you step all the way out and all of a sudden there's this little tiny little glimmer, a little vibe, a little pop. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. How about right now it's called commoning? It's called other things, right? It's got all kinds of different names, right? It's the, what is it, the hero with a thousand faces or the, the million names of God? Um, and like, okay, what is that thing? How do we catch that? How do we <laughs> blow on the, on the spark and get it to actually flame up? And how do we do that right? You know, how do you go from spark to kindling to, to, fi to fire? And how do you actually reignite the fire and, and then birth into this Phoenix movement into this third tone? So you have to hold the integrity of the third tone hold the specificity of the spark, the ember that allows us to get from here to there, and then find our way of actually doing the actual ground, on the ground, step-by-step -step, uh, embodiment, realization of that. In the meantime, recognizing that there's going to be this weird double movement because the ship we're in is sinking faster and faster. You're going to get, on the one hand, lots of folks looking to get off it, but on the other hand, lots of panic as people are rushing to get out through the doors, particularly those who are trying to figure out how to get onto the uh, whatever thing they think look like lifeboats and make, leaving everybody else without them. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm going to be very quick. Um, thank you, Richard, for um, basically saying, we, you know, what is this grounded in? Why the heck are we doing this? I know uh, you started with the how, but you said, well, where's the why? So it, it had Jordan to reiterate some of the foundations for this, this particular series. From my perspective, 
and this is a relatively recent um, realization, because as I say on my blog, uh, Tune Into Leadership, my last blog, like last Monday was like, you know, I'm an optimistic guy, I'm an upbeat guy. But 2020 and the information that I've come across, the frameworks and some of the, the data that I've seen, which I'm sure is data <laughs> that uh, Jordan, you and Daniel Smockenberg have probably been hip to for a long time, but I really grokked it this year. So in your recent presentation, um, in which you included rethinking humanity, that's one of the ones that I've taken in. So what's at stake is that we probably be, have about 10 years to get this shit together. Period. If we don't get this shit together in 10 years, we could end up going off the cliff into another dark age. Those are the stakes. So I went right to what I feel and perceive is are the solution models and paradigms and meta frames. I went right there. But Rich is saying, well, you know, that's well and good, but that's very abstract. So what I like to pose is a concept. Um, I, I, I live very much in a conceptual space. So I'm not an engineer. <laughs> um, I, I, I gravitate to the, the word intellectual. It's not a, a, a derisive term to me. I'm an intellectual. So one of the concepts that I like to bring forth that I think is very important as a bridge concept between what's called first tier and second tier, uh, a bridge between the old ways of thinking to get to the new ways of thinking in that rethinking humanity uh, manuscript uh, which is available for free folks you can get that for free you look it up you can download it it's, it's powerful they talk in that work about because of the um, confluence of technological developments in five specific sectors transportation, energy, food, information, materials, that we actually within 10 years could solve many of humanity's problems that have been a problematic for humanity, not only since the advent of capitalism, but even before that. But if we don't have a governing system to manage the change that the technology represents, that's where we could fall off into the dark age. What they frame as the distinction, they, they talk about the age of extraction that basically happened from the time we transitioned from hunter-gatherer to the agricultural, okay? Um, and what the technology, and they're not technological utopists uh, or utopists, you know, they're, they're realists, but they talk about the potential and the possibility space of what could be if we're able to manage this within the next decade. So they contrast the age of extraction versus the age of freedom. And they project that within 10 years, we literally could as a humanity for about 250 maybe to $300 a month have all of the food, transportation, information, all of that stuff that we need. All of humanity, even with the population issues, we have the ability to do that. So we have a choice. Are we gonna get this shit together within a decade or not? And for me, the ways to do it is by at least, oh, embracing, I'm kind of going all over the place. Now don't, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you can tell this is live. All right, let me, let me, sorry. And I'm going to put this on, on, um, on mute. I do apologize. I mean, airplane mode. Okay. Let me get back to the concept. Okay, I went around. The concept I want to offer that is a bridge concept from the age of abstraction to the age of freedom is rooted cosmopolitanism. This is a concept that comes from Kwame Anthony Appiah, one of the preeminent philosophers of our times and preeminent public intellectuals of our time. So rooted cosmopolitanism for me 
is a way that we can look at what we look at as human roots, foundations, grounding. On whatever level you're talking about, you know, uh, identity, uh, practices. But the cosmopolitan for me is a conception, and, and I'm sorry for going back to a term, you know, back to the back to the Greeks, but hey man, that's that's part of our Western heritage, you know. <laughs> um, the cosmopolitan is being a citizen of the world, the planet, and even of the cosmos. So you have a rooted identity, right? And that's cool. But you also have larger frames of care and concern uh, and embrace. And so I think it's a bridge concept between what in spiral dynamic, dynamics is called first tier and second tier. That concept I see as a bridge way of, of, of actually getting there. And I'd just like to offer that. And I'm going to bring in Nora. It doesn't seem like she's so I got to bring in Nora, but I'll, I'll, I'll let other folks speak before I bring in Nora, because <laughs> she's in, integral to this too. Thanks for that, uh, Greg. I really like this idea, this, this idea of, of root cosmopolitanism, because I think, and I'm going to join you bashfully and recoursing to the Greeks just for a moment, and then I'll give it up. But uh, it, what it does to me, it strikes me as an opportunity to kind of revivify the old affinity between the, the microcosmos of the individual and then the macrocosmos of the society in which they're rooted. And that affinity, we don't realize just how fundamental that affinity is to the way that our beliefs are configured and the way that our relation to the world is configured and has been or was, I should say. It's sad to say it in the past tense for such a long time. And then this brings me back into the musical metaphor, this fantastic jazz metaphor that couldn't be more perfect because it's that, that frame of understanding allows us to understand what – so each of us, in a sense, could be understood. We, we talk about as, ourselves as individual instruments and bringing our instruments into an orchestra and then having some kind of virtual governance as the conductor of that orchestra that helps us to cohere around melodies, establish continuity and consistency, and then also to disrupt the, mel the melodies definitionally in order that we can find new melodies and improvise our way extemporally or, ex or, or um, to extemporize ourselves into new arenas that uh, are beyond the boundaries of the configuration of the orchestra at present. So there is a way in which each of us as an individual is an instrument brought to um, an instrument brought to the brought to the brought to the jam. But there's also a way in which we are all orchestras, right? Intrapsychically, we are all orchestras and we have to cohere the individual instruments that comprise the conscious and unconscious influences that ultimately cohere our understanding of the world and our affordance for action and the existential burden of decision that comes with it. And again, this kind of map on to the, 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 the way that that's, this has been projected in terms of the rights, the affordance for action, the responsibilities, the existential um, burden of decision or indecision. What I think of something like what Kierkegaard called the vertigo of freedom, right? Which has to ultimately be tutored by a power that it grounds out in. And so that mus the musicality of that metaphor helps to cohere the idea that the, the internal orchestra can be configured by the relationship to the common orchestra, that the common orchestra helps to be to interject itself into the internal orchestra and the internal orchestra helps to reproject itself into the common orchestra. And they are not identical, but they are affined. And getting that relationship right is a very tricky thing, right? It's that the individuated and the participated aspects of being that are so, that are so uh, disjunctive at present. And it, something like, it involves something like the right melody to cohere them together. And so in many ways, I think, and the, the right melody changes, right? The right, there is no eternal melody, right? The cosmic spheres don't bespeak the same consistent recurrent melody, right? The, the eternal melody is beyond us, right? Neil Young had, Neil Young had this dream, I think about, he's always dreaming of like the, the, the perfect song and he wakes up and he can't remember what the perfect song was. So it's something like the quest to find the right melody for the moment to open the symbolic affordance for the cohesion of the internal and external orchestras. And that's kind of how I'm 
piecing this together. I am bursting to say something, but I really see I'm uh, as a jazz man, I'm very keen to make sure everybody gets a chance to solo and that my particular solo when it's time for me to improvise doesn't go on for too long. So I, what I like to do is ask Richard if he'd like to come back, but I, I'm gonna get to it. I'm just like bursting at the seams to, to like continue. But Richard- Go for it, go for it. Oh, thank room, you, go for thank it. you, man, I appreciate <laughs> it. Okay, all right. Now, now we're gonna engage in what uh, Evan Thompson's father uh, calls mind jazz. At least that I, that's what I'm getting ready to do. So I'm gonna let it rip. Okay, so thank you for bringing back in the musical metaphor, Christopher. All right, so we're talking about Self as instrument, which ties into something that Richard said, self as instrument, right? We're also talking about self as instrument in relationship to larger social frames. And one of those social frames we're talking about is commoning in a, in a, in a way of conceiving and perceiving of it beyond the market and the state, okay? We're also talking about the self as instrument in relation to others, right? So that's an intersubjective dynamic. And for me, that's cultural. So when we look at, for example, Ken Wilber's four quadrants, the lower left is the intersubjective realm. That's where culture lives. So it's in that space in between the self as instrument and our interpersonal relations with others and our larger social frames that we deal with. Okay, so that. Nora, I said, I'm gonna bring in Nora. Now here's when Nora comes in. I'm gonna tell you all the story of my interaction with Nora. And I so wish she were here, but she'll see this. My first interaction with Nora Bateson took place on Facebook a couple of years ago. And this is after I watched her wonderful um, uh, movie that she made about her father, Gregory Bateson, An Ecology of Mind. And in that film, she talks about her father's concept of the double bind. And certainly, I think today, when we talk about all of these, the chaos that we're in, the, the entropic forces that seem to be just tearing down this civilization, we got double, triple, quadruple binds. But as far as the double bind, for those who may not know, it's a situation where you're confronted with two irreconcilable demands or a choice between two undesirable courses of action, right? It's also psychologically a predicament where a person receives from one source messages that allow no appropriate response to be made broadly. Give a quick example. So there's a parent who says to a child, hitting is wrong, do not hit. The child ends up hitting his brother or sister. So the parent says, hitting is wrong, do not hit, then hits the child. That's a double bind for the child. It's like, wait a second, if it's wrong, why are you hitting me? That's a double bind. So in this movie, in this film, she says, how do you get out of the double bind? I'll never forget it. And the, her father's answer and her answer was, you improvise. You have to improvise a response so that brings it to jazz. I'll give another quick example. A Zen master says, if you say this stick is real, I will beat you. If you say this stick is not real, I will beat you. If you say nothing, I will beat you with this stick. That's a bind. Because no matter what you do, it seems, you're going to get beat. What's the improvisation? The improvisation in one case was where the student flipped the script. It walked up to the master, grabbed the stick and broke that motherfucker. Okay? <laughs> okay, that was an improvisation. So some of this we're gonna have to improvise. This is an emergent dynamic that we can't predict. So the improvisation is there, back to Nora. I saw this film, I was moved by this film. I reached out to her on Facebook. I said, I saw the film. It was available for free on YouTube. That film was not supposed to be available for free. 
it was on Vimeo where you could buy it. So she says, okay, it's great that you're excited, but that's not really supposed to be, you know, on YouTube. So we had some back and forth, back and forth. And I realized that she thought I had uploaded it. And she was dealing with me in a humane, empathetic manner. Now, I look at myself and I, and I say, if, my, if I'm doing a film on my father's legacy or my mentor's legacy, and someone does something like put up that video in the commons that is YouTube without permission, I'm gonna be pissed off. And when I realized that Nora had been dealing with me thinking that I had done it, but dealing with me with empathy and with care, I said to her, I said, you know something? You're an advanced human being. She was showing the virtue we're talking about in that interpersonal space, right? So I'll stop there. Um, but to me, these are some, what, uh, some of examples of what um, Kenneth Burke calls representative anecdotes, small stories that tell a larger you know, narrative uh, and, and even meta narrative. I'm going to pick up. Thanks for the lead in, Greg. Um, I've been thinking about this music metaphor. And for me, what we're talking about, it's not even really a metaphor. Like it literally is the same as like, if the job is like the rethinking humanity thing, okay, we've got this choice point between breakdown and breakthrough. And we want to get our shit organized so that we have the one where more people survive and there's less suffering. Um, and if we think about how this metaphor to say jazz music. I don't think anyone, like before jazz existed, I don't think anyone sat around and had this um, conversation, like how are we going to invent jazz? Like, wouldn't it be great if jazz existed? We need to really get organized and convince millions of people that syncopation and these weird chords are interesting. And we're gonna to need tons of bands. We're gonna to have to organize all these bands. like. <laughs> That's not how it works, right? Like certainly there were some people having a really large perspective. They were thinking about the global space of music. Uh, they were exploring limitations and trying things out. Um, but the, the actual units of coordination in the production of this thing we now call jazz, like there was mostly really small groups. There were bands. And then occasionally you'd have like an orchestra Occasionally you might have a festival where a bunch of bands get together and they exchange and then we've got recording. But there wasn't like, uh, it wasn't required to have a large scale organization um, or a plan. You know, like there was definitely a sense of this is jazz and that's not jazz. Like there's some discernment, like um, even, and some of that I think was just novelty, but then the, the, there's like novelty sends us in the, in the right direction. And then we've got to like whittle it down and go, is that, is that jazz? Oh no, now we're, and then they kept inventing other things. And it's like, well, now we've got punk and we've got all these other things. And I'm glad for, for the, um, the way that it's exploded into lots of different things. Um, I'm really into that mode of producing this next commons based society that we want to live in. Uh, that really makes sense to me. That's really like a logical plan. And I don't see that much of that. Um, it doesn't look to me like uh, other people really get that, that, that many people really get that, that, that we don't have to take responsibility for the whole, that we just have to take responsibility for our band. And maybe occasionally it's good to have like a, 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 someone who can organize a festival, you know, like to, to bring that connection. But the the festival is actually only the tiniest um, encounter. It's a temporary encounter. And actually the permanent, the permanent experimentation is happening in a really, really small scale. Um, and I guess that's my proposition that I'd like to test against some, um, some other smart humans, I guess, is that like my sense has been, yeah, I want to live in that future. Um, and I, have just followed my inner compass or whatever that tells me that's jazz, you know, that's jazz over there and that's not. And I've been heading in that direction. And I got the sense that this commons future requires me to be a different person than the like extractive, uh, top-down, domineering, 
competitive one. It, I need to become a different person. And it seems like it's through the improv that I'm, that I'm becoming that person, you know, that something's changing me. And I'm thinking again about how improv actually works in music, right? Like, you don't just find a random person off the street and you say, start improvising. Well, you can, but it's probably not going to be feel very musical to most people. But you do a lot of preparation. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of like, you're getting your head in gear. But then when you're actually improvising, you don't have a plan. You know, and that's the, that's the paradox here of like, how are we, yeah, what are the practice spaces? What are the, um, what are the festivals? What are the, what is the equivalent of the sheet music, you know? And, and you notice like most jazz, like the actual sheet music is usually written in a really, really stripped down way. It's like, what's the minimum set that we need to convey here, leaving the maximum room for interpretation and creativity. I guess that's, um, yeah, I'm just really juiced up about that metaphor as not a metaphor, as a literal plan for like, this is how I see social change. Like this is how I see the job that we're undertaking. And so, yeah, that's the proposition I want to check if, if that is that how you all are seeing it too. The stoa is an example of what you're talking about. It's an example of, of John Ferveke's, you know, dialogos in action. So you're talking about not just a theorizing, you're talking about a praxis, you're talking about theory in practice, an actualization, an embodied actualization of it. So yes, uh, totally, totally agree. Since we kept come, keep coming back to the jazz model and, and, and jazz is my thing, I'll, I'll just lay out a couple of quick frameworks and then I'm going to like, you know, uh, go to the bar, get a drink while other cats solo, okay? Uh, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. So as far as jazz, the development of jazz, you can look at it in a couple of ways. You can look at jazz as being birthed through Black American culture, okay? Black American culture in actuality is a composite or synthesis of elements from European culture and African culture. So it's already what my mentor, Albert Murray, would call an omni-American dynamic, okay? So yes, you do have the dynamic of small groups and festivals, definitely. Uh, but before we get to that, you gotta start with the blues. You gotta start with that individual blues man, usually, and the classic blues with the guitar or the harmonica accompanying his or herself and singing about life. And through the very process of singing about life and the troubles of life and the challenges of life, finds a way to enact a, a, a therapeutic uh, model uh, uh, and practice that's not only therapeutic for his or herself, but therapeutic for the group, the community that from which that comes. So then you get into a, a, a mythopoetic ritual space that's developed, right? Then you have in this cauldron, particularly in New Orleans, this cauldron of French culture, Spanish culture, uh, Catholicism, uh, 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 being a primary unit of culture there as opposed to Protestantism elsewhere, where the French culture uh, and the colonial culture being different from the British colonial culture and allowing more space for development. You have in New Orleans a, 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 a confluence of, of very, very, very highly trained musicians in terms of that orchestral chamber music, Western European model, right? With musicians who play by ear, who don't read music, but because music is auditory, they're able to play. And then the irony of history, you had, there was a lot of freedom in New Orleans, 18th, 19th century, more freedom for movement and, and interaction for people of color particularly for free blacks than there were in other parts. Then you had Jim Crow that said, okay, uh, you Creoles, you people who are mixed, you need to like, you know, we, we gotta have a clear delineation by, by race. So if you're mixed, you know, you with the blacks. So you had this, you had this uh, uh, gathering 
of highly trained musicians with those who played by ear. And out of that kind of tension came the techniques of jazz. This is something that Ralph Ellison says. New Orleans jazz is mainly a collective dynamics. Out of the cauldron of New Orleans in the 20s came Sidney Bechet on soprano saxophone and Louis Armstrong on trumpet. Louis Armstrong represents the advent of the heroic individual soloist in jazz. In the 30s, the big band era, more of a collective, then took Louis Armstrong's innovations and put it in a big band context. Bebop, and I could go, I could go on with the same individual collective. I could go through the entire history of jazz. I won't. Um, so, I mean, jazz is a wonderful metaphor. The problem, and this is me, you know, trying to be a little more scientific. The problem with the jazz metaphor is the issue of scale. The jazz trio, the rhythm section, that's the fundamental unit. Then you add leaders, you know, bass play, I'm sorry, uh, uh, say trumpet, saxophone on top of that. Then you have a big band where in jazz, unlike orchestral music, there's more improvisation, but it's still more structured because for the most part, you've got to read those charts unless you're talking about what's called head arrangement like the Count Basie band. That's basic structures, basic melodies, blues melodies. If you're doing more complex, arrangements and orchestrations, it's got to be read with some room for improvisation. The problem we're talking about, I think, and Jordan, you tell me if I'm wrong, is that this needs to be done on a scale where we can get to a critical mass of people of a certain level of consciousness, a tipping point where, like in the Renaissance, a small group of people were able to because of their new way of seeing the world, impact the entire society. I don't know if the jazz big band is gonna be a good enough metaphor for the type of scale we need. Now, I didn't have to say that, but that's me being critical of my own model, which I think is another important aspect that we have to engage in. And I don't know the answer to that, I really don't. Nora is in the house. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Um, so, whoosh, so much, so much water is already under the bridge. It's difficult to kind of hold on to different pieces of it. Uh, I, I notice a, uh, a recency bias, right? The stuff that's been said most recently uh, lingers most in the, in, the, in the mind, but I'm hoping that the, the other things that wanted to be said are still kind of like percolating in the soul. For example, the notion of the blues, I had this sort of funny thought uh, come through my head of coordinating that with uh, what's it called theory U, like the bottom of the U. The blues is all about going to the bottom of the U, feeling the fullness of the agony of being in the world without the least bit of denial or avoidance, and yet coming back with the tone of a yay saying spirit and saying, hey, can you hear that? That. Now come with me. Right? And then as you come in, that's, that's discernment, right? So that's like a retuning to the bass tone, like the tone of the universe itself as the fundamental and reconnecting with it and finding your way back into the ability to hear. And then from that capacity to hear, you can then refine, right? And of course, discernment is the ability to listen to what the field is actually communicating, to what wants to be said, what is to be spoken and learning how to differentiate in a very rich way, right? Not in a planning way, not in the sort of the analytical semantic finite state way, but in a very different way. And as we discern together and we refine each other, we become instruments of mutually improving each other's capacity to engage in that. We shift now, okay, from metaphor to mapping, right? To, to jazz into being. Let's shift modes, right? Let's, just, let's not just take like, we, we may have a mental model of jazz as being something that's associated with the thing called music, which is auditory. Right? But to jazz into being, I need to be able to do this with like a hammer. I need to be able to do it with a computer keyboard. I need to be able to do it with my child, right? All possible aspects of embodiment need to be subject to the instrumentality of what we're jazzing into being. And as you say, all possible human relationships at many, many different levels of scale. So there's like a big old song, big wide song, right? Being held by Gaia herself, the tone that we tune into and return to continuously to remind us of where we're coming from. And then there's different 
fractal levers. Right? I'm going to throw some nerd music into this just to kind of keep things real. And you have to be able to zoom in and out. You have to be able to show up in a space like this and notice the reality of the, re the, the experience of this event. Right? I've spent some time with Christopher. I've had an email from Greg. <clears throat> I've seen Richard's stuff from afar. Right? Nora showed up late. Right? So kind of a cool vibe of the mixture, what's going on. We had to go through a process, right? We had to be able to kind of enter into the space being who we are. Like we're these omnimodal jazz musicians who have to even know like, what's up? What's happening here? Why are we here? Who are we? What's the we? What's the vibe that wants to speak itself through us and tuning and playing and moving and shifting and finding. And then as we find it, can we continue to refine it until it becomes like this super clear, clear, clear. And then by the way, if you want to kind of shift metaphors again, this is like that laser beam. By the way, a good metaphor for the movement from theory to practice, the discovery of the laser beam. Um, once you figure out how to get that coherence tight, something new happens, right? A velocity, a flow of that wisdom energy, the wisdom chi connects and there's a ground where suddenly the thing that wants to emerge has the vehicle through which it can emerge, right? By the way, this and this alone is the thing that I have come to conclude has the capacity to produce the perception and agency into the world in the time frame that we have. All right, so there's a, if I look at it from a, from a design constraint, I'm seeking my engineering friends here. If I'm looking at it from a design constraint, I work all the way back. The first thing I got to do is I got to figure out how big is the problem? How much time do I have to deal with it? What do I have to have to be able to respond to the scope of the problem, the time frame that I have? All right, that's kind of like, that's the base. That's the beginning. Because if I can't, can't even resolve the problem in the time that I have, then obviously it doesn't matter what approach I take. So that design constraint of this ability to become an instrumentality that is simultaneously holding the big, big, big tone and in each individual collaboratively, consistently refining and revising our individual capacity to be who we are in relationship with that tone and tune together to form these omnimodal jazzes in real time with what's up and then shift and move and flow and float, which by the way is important, right? Peter here bringing this group together. Right? He's playing the role of like who Right? You got a, a, a why, you got a how, you got a who, and who's real important. Um, all right, that's all I got. Cultural intelligence, one way of framing it is that zooming in and out that you're talking about through the lens of culture. Another way of looking at cultural intelligence is being in between emotional intelligence and social intelligence. I'll leave it there because I would love to hear from Nora Bateson. Nor I'm going to drop you in with a good handhold, all right? Because you came in earlier. We, we had to invoke you. We had to bring you in. So Greg told a story that involved you. Um, and the way I want to bring that story in is I want to bring it into the channel of what it meant to me, like the feeling I had when I was listening to that story. And it connects very nicely with some of the stuff that Richard was saying as well, which has to do with something like, um, I don't know, skillfulness or artfulness in relationality. And the, the story that Greg told was the story of him discovering your documentary and him watching it on YouTube, getting excited, tracking you down and kind of just cold calling you and discovering later that in the conversation, you had a frame, you had assumed or thought that he was the one who had, had uh, kind of stolen it from Vimeo and put it into YouTube, which is a you know, deeply violent uh, a violation act. And yet you showed up as a person acting from a place of empathy, uh, empathy right? Now, what I felt there was I felt the experience I had as a person who does not have or did not have and still doesn't really have a huge amount of embodied like grace and being taught to dance by a person who did and being able to notice that when I'm trying, when I'm trying to just sort of like dance on my own, not getting very good, like my jazz was poor. But when she sort of held me right, and her expertise and skillfulness and the artfulness of it, my capacity went up by a factor of like a, a thousand. Like it was amazing. And to be able to feel the flow of that, like it was a learning experience that accelerated me through the process very rapidly, right? That's a key, right? A key is this notion of like, where are we when we enter into relationship and how do I hold my capacity to support anybody I'm in relationship with? And if the reality is, is that they are, um, you know, they're off in the wilderness, you know, stealing people's shit and uploading it to YouTube willy nilly, how do I find the tone, right? How do I hold and emulate the deepest embodiment of like virtue, right? So that I can become infectious with virtue where they are, right? And that, and, and, and allow the dancing to be discovered on the interior and just hold it, right? That's sort of like the, the grandmother relationship with the wayward child holding the space that tunes the child into the feeling of 
you know, the loving energy and coming, oh, more painfully through the challenges they got to get through to their own rediscovery of the blues. All right. I love that that story came up. That's great, Greg. Um, Jordan, a couple of times you've said the word bass. There's a bass tone. And as I'm hearing also the, the metaphor of jazz, one of the things that is also true about jazz is that there's the the immediate improvisation between the musicians in the moment, but there's also a larger context in which it is a given that in this format, there is improvisation. And, and that's an important piece of what's happening because it isn't as though in the moment they're having to decide, okay, are we or are we not gonna have improvisation? That's already, that's already in the meta of what jazz is. And to me, that kind of touches into some of what Jordan was saying about taking that, um, the, the improvisation metaphor into all aspects of life. But it requires a new bass tone. And I think that that, that story that you told um, about the YouTube thing, It has everything for me to do with the fact that I immediately saw you, no matter what the situation was, as, as, an, ex as, as an extension of, of the interest in these ideas and the possibilities that we might have of conversation. So the way of holding, the way that I entered that conversation with you is really important to me. Right? There's an ecology of communication here. And what's in the meta space around what it's possible to, to, to bring into that ecology, right? Is it a desert? Is it a meadow? Is it a forest? What kind of ecology are we in? Because it's not just anything, right? There are resonances. There are possibilities, there are things that are relevant in particular ecological circumstances um, in terms of ideas, in terms of tonalities of communication, in terms of who you can be or who I can be. And so for me, I think one of the things I'm actually most concerned about is uh, the past that, that is given to the underlying tonality of whatever the interaction, whatever the communication is, is liable to be laced with something like, how am I gonna use this to get ahead? What's in it for me? Um, how do I leverage this? What am I networking? Where is this going? How am I gonna get, get more, do more, be more, 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 whatever that is, which is fundamentally going to screw up that tonality pretty much from there, it's, it's, it's got that in it. And, and somehow that gets kind of written off as something that we call human nature or worse, nature. And I, I think that we, that's something for me that I'm, I'm interested in being very, very careful with uh, because it, it, First of all, I think there's a lot of patterns in there that uh, need to be looked at through the lens of addiction instead of through the lens of even, um, I guess the word that gets used so often is predatory behavior, but I got, I got corrected on that the other day, which um, I appreciated. And someone said, look, that's not how predators work. Don't assign this thing to, to to um, ecological relationships because this is something to be, to be very careful with, I think. Um, and so it's improvisation. If we don't know where we're going or our kids don't know where they're going. The grandparents don't know where they're going. 
everyone is in in flux in multiple transformations right now um, from cultural interaction to in their intimate relationships who who are you in your intimate relationships how do you do sexuality like this is this is at the core of this too um and we don't know how to go forward so there's something deeply unwritten so that's why that base tone is so important because it forms it forms the the thread through which the rest of this can come into being it forms not just the what are you going to do now but how does what do you do now go into the third and fourth and goodness knows how many orders later of relationship and everything that we, we are organized around now is around the urgency of solving the immediate problem. We got to get a solution to this or a solution to that, which has reason and is logical within the reason and logic of the existing system, of the existing way of thinking. But the actual reason and, and the, the, I mean, maybe we want to call it logic uh, 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 to of of response has to do with an ecology of communication who is it possible for you to be in this relationship with me and that's that's a different kind of question because it isn't really about what we say right now or what we do right now it's about how being in relationship with me is part of your being in relationship with other people with with your body with your land with your with your world, that I'm part of that. Um, so it's this, if you start tending relationships that are past second order, things change radically. And, and the tone changes very radically for how, how one goes into that. So I'll, I'll just throw that in and let it bounce around with you. I just want to pick up on that quickly. Um, just to double click the importantness of that question that you named, Nora, who is it possible for you to be in relationship with me? Um, the, way I, the, way I, the way that lands for me is that there's a way that I can hold up my end of the relationship that allows you more possibilities that allows more of your different characters to, um, that I can welcome, you know, that I can either repel or I can, I can attract, I can accept. And that was something that Chris said right early on about, um, I think it was Chris, that we have this community inside of us already and we can start, that's the space that we can start practicing. Um, but yeah, it just, it, that to me is, we don't know what's coming. Um, I don't really buy any of the simplistic narratives about how things are going to be good or they're going to be bad or there's a tipping point or the, any of these kind of like way, game A, game B, like all of this. I think they're useful handles that we use, right, to talk about something that's way more complex and messy and um, organic shape than that. I don't know what's the right choice, but that that attitude of like, how can I encounter another person that enables them the most amount of choice? You know, what, what can I do? To, uh, uh, how can I receive them that allows for the most of their community of characters to, to be allowed in the space with me? That's been one of my guiding uh, instincts, I guess, and it, and it really delivers results. And I think, yeah, that was the story. I think that was the point of Greg's story about it was that even when you had an opportunity to take offense, you chose that moment to like be hospitable, be caring, be generous, you know? And that, um, yeah, that's what I, I think that's what I'm trying to do as well. I really appreciate that. I'm curious what's going on in Chris's mind. You've been quiet for a little while. Yeah, thanks, uh, Greg. I was you you're, you tapped into the frequency perfectly. I was just about to jump in. I think that that same that same prompt from Nora got me thinking too. Who is it possible for you to be? And um, one of the things that one of the things that I think we ultimately are going to have to learn it's the is how to equilibrate the process of identification such that it becomes committed 
without becoming foreclosed by a, a misappropriated kind of essentialism. What I mean by that is, you know, when we're making an, an identity claim between ourselves, our subjectivity and a particular role, oftentimes the seriousness with which we adopt that role can become calcified to a degree that it can become a kind of essential identity that we can then not displace or remove ourselves from, right? And one of the things that it strikes me that one feature of a jazz ecology, if I can say it that way, is that it allows us to, the givenness of the ecology allows us to assume a role and an identity and to be known in virtue of that role. But implicit to that role is the, is the kind of proleptic realization of its death. Right. So one of the things that Carr says about the infinite game is that in the infinite game, death comes in the course of play. And that the death of an identity and the death of a role is a, an important feature of our relationship to that role. And it doesn't undermine its realness because its realness is ultimately contextualized, but then so is our action. So is our decision. So one way of thinking about it to me is, you know, you are someone slightly different, opposite each individual relationship that you have. And who you are in the privacy of that relationship cannot be replicated or reproduced into your other relationships, right? You can't, now you can, those relationships re-sow themselves in the way that you interact with future persons and future identities and possibilities. But fundamentally, they are unique, they're singular, and they're irreducible. They are roles that we play. But we wouldn't say of those roles that they were unreal or that they were trivial or superficial simply because they have a finite context. And so there's something about the kind of the copula, the is that connects us to various roles in the world that has to be both real and committed, but also has to contain within it the possibility or maybe even the inevitability of its death and its finitude, right? Death has to be encoded within the rules of play so that they can be both, they can be both, they can allow both for the optimal grip, but they allow, they can allow for the relinquishing of that grip when it comes time to relinquish it. So that, that's what comes to mind as, uh, as, you, as you're all speaking. We need what your colleague calls serious play, right? <laughs> we need some yes. serious- Yes, yes, that's what, yeah, exactly. Yeah, serious play. And um, I would say um, our intention, though we may not, we have the, uh, the uncertainty, not knowing what's gonna happen. Uh, we have to have what uh, Keats called negative capability. We have to have an openness to being comfortable with being uncomfortable because we don't know and it's uncertain. Hoping that what will emerge will be pro-social, but knowing that there's a possibility that this shit could all come tumbling down. The reality of that, the blues reality of that. Uh, so I would just leave with intention, intentionality. What's our intentions in our engagements with one another and with groups of people and using that intentionality as a tonal center, uh, timbral, you know, like uh, in music, you've got four basics, rhythm, melody, harmony, and, and timbre, tone color. So what's the texture of your intentionality as we go into this, and that could be part of a virtuous, you know, uh, 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 the virtual, the, the virtual virtues that you mentioned at the very beginning, but let's develop ourselves as instruments so that we can actually engage with the world and engage with each other as virtuosos, where we enact virtue in the engagement, but to do that, as we say in you know, uh, Jazz Leadership Project, the company I'm CEO of, uh, you got to go deep in the shed. You got to do a lot of study, a lot of practice. And as Jordan said, but sometimes it ain't just about you being in your room, playing your horn with the records. You got to go out and engage with somebody, and sometimes you're gonna have to have some mentors. 
you have to have some folks to show you the way. And a lot of times those mentors can be, you know, if it's in person, it's great. But the books, you know, the, the, the legacy of literature and, and you can really get a lot of lessons through, through your reading, but ultimately you're gonna have to get on the stage and play with others. So let's try to be, you know, virtuosos of, of whatever we do and, and what we say and what we play. I think that one thing that I've noticed with the warm data lab work, um, which has been so fascinating uh, for me, just, I mean, I'm still learning about it as it's happening. It's, um, is, that in this process there are there's a question um, that that a group is taking on, and that then they move through various contexts whenever they it depends if it's in person or online. They move through multiple contexts and they discuss this question, whether it's you know I don't know what's being revealed or what's essential or something like that. One of the interesting ones is actually what are you tending? or what's continuing? These are because of course those are very ecological questions. And then look at it through the through if it's online a triple context. So like, uh, what are you tending through the context of family, uh, politics, and environment? And immediately there's a, a, a the, the triple contexting thing is going to require there to be some connective process, a different approach. And in doing this, one of the things that happens is people get uh, they get off their scripts. They get off the things they're used to having rehearsed, having said in particular roles to particular people, to particular outcomes for particular um, positioning in, a, in communication. And, and that's really important because what happens is that they start to actually just tell stories. They start to talk about things they didn't have any idea they would be talking about and talking about it with people they had no idea they were ever going to be speaking with. And, and then they get moved to another set of a few contexts and then they talk about those three. Okay, that's the about level. This is the talking about part. And, but that's, that's kind of what's interesting because that's what what we like to do. That's how there has been, you know, a lot of a lot of need to talk about. And there's a, a simultaneous zoom in and zoom out going on. You're talking about the details of your grandmother's recipe, but you know you're in a context in which there's lots of contexts. So it's a, it's simultaneously zoom in and zoom out, which immediately shifts the the approach that people come in with. And it doesn't matter whether it's um, professional people or people in really devastated communities, whether they're in Asia or Africa or the US or Europe or South America or, right? It doesn't matter. There's, we're using this all over the place now. Um, but within about an hour and a half, there's been a shift. And without a lot of jargon, they, the people in these conversations are doing pretty substantial complexity theory dialoguing, but without any of the externalities of that. So, you know, the map is not the territory and the language of complexity is not the complexity. It's really easy to talk about complexity without it being complex. It's much harder to be in it and to, to be in response, l working in the complexity in your elbows with your kid on the bus. That's another thing, right? So moving into a different modality of where the response is coming immediately from this perception, not just a visual, but sensorial perception of the complexity that you are within. Um, and one thing that comes out of there, you talked about virtue, but it's some kind of very generous integrity. 
and and generous not in the sense of i'm going to give you one of these cuz i've got four <laughs> but but generous at the level of this is how my heart pumps blood to my toes like that's not an act of generosity but it is an act of generosity but it's not one that makes me altruistic um it's just it's just life making life it's just life lifing and that is a generous process if it holds back there's a problem and yet in order to get ahead to leverage to to what's in it for me to to adopt all of those base tones there is a hold back necessary and so this what i'm seeing is how actually this it's like there's this parallel realm just sitting there and all we have to do is just tap into it just be there it's like the sky's up there if you don't look at it you don't see it but it was there and it also requires a very sophisticated approach to get into it that doesn't immediately charge it with causality. Otherwise, you're back where you started again. And um, if, you, if you go in with a specific intent to achieve a specific result, that's exactly what you can't do. <laughs> so there's a, a, it's a really interesting relationship with intent. It's intent to allow which is really different than intent to manipulate. And there's a lot there, right? You brought in integrity. Yeah. You brought in something like a, a really nuanced sensibility of integrity. Like there's this, this sense of uh, like, I don't know, feeling like connectedness. When you're talking about generosity, you know, it's like flipping back and forth between different senses of the notion of generosity. And there's like the, the, the generosity that comes from a integral connectedness where the, the 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 forging of the continuity of contact is the thing and therefore the flow flows you know and, and and from the point of view of separateness it may feel like generosity but from the point of view of, of something like this integrousness uh it's a different kind or a different tone on the note of generosity <clears throat> i would point out by the way that you're very nicely uh for me at least setting up the the, the vibe that i feel when I speak of this notion of game A and game B, and particularly the word game, like the gameness of it. Like there's something about how we show up, there's something about where we show up, the context, right? There's something about the, the relationality and it begins to produce itself. And there's something, if you can kind of get it in this zone, it moves over here and this begins to have integrity. And there's all kinds of little situations where that integrity can pop and then it shifts over here. And this has some way of, of being what it is too. Um, and so there's a, you know, a, a distinct, like radically non-trivial simplicity of the artfulness of, of, of noticing that it's a dimensionality that is here right now at all times. And yet somehow it can all be this weird thing where it can be nearly impossible to get there and particularly challenging to hold it. Um, this is where the word sovereignty, like when I, when I tried to steal the culture of sovereignty and give it a new meaning, that's it, right? The, the, the sovereignty is the, certain, the discernment of my capacity to hold the integrity of this other place in the in, in the context that I am in right now, and you know there's only so much. And you've got this, you know, Nora in relationship with Greg was able to be sovereign in that relationship and hold it, even though she had, you know, things going on in her interior that had you know created turbulence and concern. But you know, as a parent, I know that quite often my two-year-old can push me past my levels of sovereignty, and I need to have ways of behaving to maintain the integrity of the context when I can't be the one who's showing up to hold the space, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's an artfulness in the complexity of actually being able to live this thing into continuity. So that actually the coherence holds over long periods of time with lots of different people. So I'm, I'm gonna jump in now because we have uh, three minutes to the bottom of the hour. Uh, and we skipped the Q&A because it felt quite alive with this uh, conversation. Um, so I'm gonna suggest that uh, the, the, the speakers just share anything that's alive for them as a closing thought. And then uh, Jordan will go last and maybe close out the, the series. Um, so whoever feels called to go, may go. Just to say uh, thank you, really. That's my only parting thought. Thank you uh, both Peter and Jordan for the invitation and uh, Greg, Nora, uh, Richard. It was really great talking to, to all of you. 
I'd like to echo that thanks. Um, and I'd just like to leave with an, um, a framing from a book called The Music of the Common Tongue by uh, British uh, music theorist, Christopher Smalls. Um, he talks about how within Black American music, utopia actually comes into play, not as a social system, but as a way to have these momentary, through the course of playing music together, in which there is the dynamic of those playing, those who are listening, and the, then those who are even outside in the larger context that Nora referred to, that there are moments of heartfelt continuity that are like moments of utopia but then that utopia dies and comes back and that's going to be kind of the way it has to go so we have to embrace that that experience that you had with live music and you were you know you went to another place that was in that moment and it's gone you know but the question is can we rebirth once it's been died and hopefully we can regenerate um if things do go sideways and off the cliff, hopefully we can regenerate uh, the next time through with um, better, uh, good, true, and beautiful. Um, I'm also grateful, happy. I've been really engaged and having a good time. I guess I've got one last thing, uh, sort of parting offer. Um, thinking about, you know, now what? And I want to reiterate what Jordan said about the dance partner, like how much easier it is to learn how to dance when you've got someone who's, who's like showing you the steps. Um, like the reason it's been great. I've been really enjoyed nursing the life out of this uh, musical metaphor. Um, the reason that we called our company the hum is because like, there's a lot of metaphors stacked in there that are musical, but one of them is like, um, Basically, our job is to go and support collaborative groups to work more effectively, to bring them into harmony, to kind of tune up their orchestra. And, and the picture in my mind with the hum is that when you have a um, barbershop quartet, you know, you know, a bunch of people there, they're ready to sing. And just before the start of the song, there's someone who will hum a note or they'll whistle on the pitch pipe or something to just give that starting note. And then, and then they're free, you know, then they're ready to roll. Um, that's what we're trying to do is like bring, this is, this is kind of how you play. And then and then get out of the way and let them play. And I think probably that's what Nora's doing as well with the warm data stuff. That there's like there's a methodology to it for sure, which you can kind of document, but you're also showing people how to play it, you know. And I'm sure you've got co-hosts that are also showing them how. And so I guess that my invitation to people um, is to find who in your life are the, are the are the most accomplished players and would they be willing to let you you know, hang out with them and play because it's the, it's by far the best way to learn is to be doing it with other people that you look up to. And I feel like I've been doing that here um, with some really exquisite dancers. So thanks for having me. You're on mute, Nora. I guess um, one thing that has been so important for me uh, is to find some humor in catching myself falling into old patterns. Uh, and they're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. So that when we're talking about collaboration, that metaphor can so easily become a mechanism. It, and before you know it, you know, Greg's doing what Greg does best and Jordan does what Jordan does best and Richard and Christopher are doing what they do best. And that cannot be what the collaboration is that we're talking about, right? Because Jordan and Greg are gonna be totally different with me and, and in this space than they are in other spaces. And so the whole idea of what we mean by this kind of, you know, where we got to come together and work together, but that is a absolutely living process. It is not defined by the rules and regulations of metric control. And um, 
it's those sorts of things. They're, they're lurking everywhere. These hangovers from old ways of thinking. And, and, you know, I catch myself in them all the time. And the only thing to do in that moment is just say, mm -hmm, there it was again. And, you know, all right. I, I, I'm, and it's like little, you know, each, each cell of my body has to kind of become attentive in a different way than it has before in this, in this kind of relationship. So I think for me, that's the big one is just remembering in our observ observations that the language, the patterns, the, the history that we're observing through is inherently holding the patterns and trying to perpetuate them. So it takes a really diligent um, and affectionate, loving, graceful warmth to, to be in that and not wrong it and not blame it and not try to kill it or repress it or, you know, edit it out or, but to, just to recognize it's there and that it's, it's asymmetrical and it's going to have to be part of how we go forward. So that's, I just wanted to say that. Um, so a few things that have, have um, shown up in this conversation, uh, what Nora just said, and something that Richard said, I think it actually was one of the very first things he said, which had to do with an awareness of the necessity of a journey uh, of the self, a change in the interior, a way of showing up that is maybe the, the, the kind of the central thread. You know, the, the, the thing that is the at least most ready at hand and sine qua non, so you might as well start there. Um, and the and the the feeling of what it means to be able to move along that thread. Uh, my my friend um, Miriam, who I think has actually been part of the Stoa, is that right, Peter? You want to know? Awesome. Um, you know, she taught me and Vanessa the language of of we're all we're all learning. You know that as from a parenting point of view, like the, the mode of being able to constantly moving through a space of self-forgiveness so that you can develop, you can learn, you can, you can kind of allow love to come through into yourself as you catch yourself. Um, and and that's, a, that's the way, right? That's the way that you actually do grow in the right direction. You put light so that this poor plant that's been stuck under a rock and trying to find a way to the surface can finally bubble out into the sun and then grow towards the sunlight. How do you become the sun of yourself? Um, and I feel like that notion of the bass tone, right? the notion of going down to the blues before you jazz and always noticing the, the necessity of the groundedness and the feeling of like, if you aren't already playing from a broken heart, you gotta go back. You gotta find that place and learn how to say yes from that and bring it back out into the world. And then begin the, the marching orders now are one of, of skillfulness and playfulness. Like, I'd, like to, I'd like to take John's term and add one more term. I'm just gonna steal from Greg because he dropped it today skillful fucking play right skillful fucking play man you got to come hard but this is real this is the most real thing that has ever been this is the path of meaningfulness in its absolute essence you got to get out there you got to get some serious skillful fucking play all right that's the marching orders that's what we're out about right now in yourself like just keep going down into yourself with that loving kindness and the commitment simultaneously right you got to love that thing into being because growing up is happening it's hard and it's painful we're gonna to have to grow our way out of this for real. Like not just saying it, not like a, you know, grow up. <laughs> I mean, actually doing it, which is seriously hard. Like I, I know that that little uh, narcissist in me loves to try to avoid that. Like that's a real good thing to not do because that's hard. Um, and my sense is this, like here's a key thing I wanna bring out there to everybody, which is I get the distinct feeling that the, 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 the lives that we live are gonna get real fucking uncomfortable. I get the distinct feeling that 2020 was like the, the, the apertif. It was the, the beginning of a process of us beginning to have to recognize the reality that the thing we've been riding on that has allowed us to avoid the responsibility that has always, always been ours is in fact now ours, <laughs> like for real. And uh, 
the beauty of it is, is that that thing that Nora called out, which is like a, a false urgency. A, oh, I got to fucking fix this thing with the wrong tools coming from the wrong place with the wrong sense is going to keep trying to come up because that uncomfortableness is going to kind of try to keep it in that. It's going to be weird. It's going to be a weird notion of like, no, actually the right thing right now is to start doing some serious fucking play. Right, to slow it down because if you don't build with the right tool, if you don't build with the right self, you don't come from the right place. If it's not grounded deep, deep, deep into that base tone, you can't feel it. And you can't actually make every single move from that place. Right? If there is even the littlest gap in those stones when you're trying to build that stone wall in Machu Picchu, the whole thing's going to come tumbling down. So you got to be able to really, really tune into that, even as you know everything around you is telling your uh, hominid body oh shit, <laughs> I got to take care of myself right now. Um, anyway, that's my sense. You know, obviously I could be way wrong. I'm wrong all the time. But I'd like to thank everybody for showing up. This has had um, a beautifully interesting journey. You know, this, this uh, uh, we call it divine selfishness that we entered into here. It's been very helpful for me at least. And so I hope that I can then be of service and bring that helpfulness, metabolize it and bring it back out to uh, further the whole. Beautiful. Uh, serious fucking play has to be a session at the Stoa uh, in the new year. Just throw the F word in any phrase and, you know, I'm one over. Uh, so uh, before I make some closing announcements, I just wanted a deep gratitude and thanks to Richard, Greg, Nora, and Christopher for coming today. Uh, and uh, especially for Jordan for doing this reverse sense maker and uh, resident series. Jordan was the first person who launched the STOA. So uh, it means a lot for him to come here and do a sense maker residence. Uh, I hope to see him in the new year as well. Um, so upcoming announcements, we have uh, Forrest Landry's session at 5 p.m. Eastern time. That's his last session for his series. And then tomorrow we have a new uh, series being launched called Ontological Design Sessions with Daniel Frega and Owen Cox and friends. Uh, and I'm going to take in our first homegrown sense maker at the STOA, uh, who's having a sense maker in residence series in the new year, Evan McMullen. Uh, Evan, if you can uh, mute yourself and plug uh, your series. Yeah, so I... Uh... Funny enough, my series is called The Bridge, so I thought it uh, quite fitting that Greg was uh, uh, going to such lengths talking about bridges here. I, I really enjoyed that and uh, enjoyed the whole conversation. It'll be a decent, I think, um, follow up in some ways to some of the things that have come out here. Um, the Bridge is, in essence, an attempt to do a couple things. One is uh, it's inspired by an article that David Chapman wrote riffing on the Keegan stages, talking about a bridge between Keegan 4 and Keegan 5. But also, the bridge name refers to the fact that it's, in, a, in essence, an attempt to create a sort of neutral ground or translation layer or meta language for people who have engaged with various different traditions of phenomenological self-inquiry to be able to have a common uh, way of speaking about these things that's not so bound up in the cultural context from which the specific traditions derive. So we'll be uh, taking a series of deep dives, uh, sort of deeper into the content I presented in the first bridge session on the STOA, which is already uh, the recordings up. So the deep dives will go into, for the first session, neurophilosophy, the second session, embodied practice, the third session, bridging communitas, and then the fourth session is going to be a bit speculative and experimental, but the theme there is bridging science and magic, a dialectical synthesis of those two worldviews, which I think is uh, kind of what was being gestured out in this session as well. So I hope anyone who is interested can uh, make it there, and if not, um, it'll be recorded and I'm pretty easy to find. So uh, thanks, everyone. Beautiful. And Evan is just some genius that came out of nowhere. He was a hermit for like 15 years. Uh, so it's my favorite kind of geniuses. So thank you, Evan. Um, our website, Patreon and Substack uh, for more for more events. So everyone, thanks for coming.